Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 14, titled, An Invitation. Good morning and welcome. Nice to see all your faces ready to study the Bible. Luke chapter 14, we're making our way through the book of Luke. And uh, finding ourselves at an unusual spot in Luke just because we are going to be accelerating here. And not because of any kind of necessity other than just simply the way the text is organized. We have spent almost, we spent almost three years in the first 13 chapters, which is, yeah, that's, can't you go faster? I guess I could, but then we wouldn't be as thorough. Um, I uh, am only limited to what the text has, but now we're going to be doing some major, major gains, I guess you could say, in the next several chapters. We're entering into the chapters in Luke are called the, the, the parables of Luke, which of course Luke didn't give them, Jesus did. But these parables in some cases take up three quarters, or in some cases almost an entire chapter. And so the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole parable is really, really just one sermon. And so since, since there's a, Jesus takes out big chunks, we take out big chunks. Jesus takes out small bits, we take out small bits. So, so that's where we are. We're Luke chapter 14, we're going to be down in verses, well we'll be in verse 1, but then down in verses 13 through 24, this this parable of a feast and the invitation uh, of a feast. And the, the, the circumstances are, we find it there in verse 1 of chapter 14. It came about when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread. A Sabbath, of course, is a Saturday. But they had similar, uh, I don't know if y'all were raised in a community where, where you went out and had Sunday afternoon meals were a big deal. Well, Sabbath afternoon or Saturday afternoon meals were a big deal for them. The local preacher, of course, in this case was none other than Jesus. They invite him over to their house not because they like him. They're trying to trap him. Just watch what he says here. Leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath day to eat bread, and they were watching him closely. They just wanted him to say just the right thing or just the wrong thing, however you want to look at it. And they have a setup here. We're not going to read it, but they've, they've set in front of him this man who has a particular disease, and they've done this before. In fact, he healed in a synagogue a woman and they, they, of course, were of the opinion it was wrong to heal on the Sabbath day. They considered it work. Again, it was their rules based as splashing up against God's rules, and the Son of God gets to decide what those rules are. And, of course, he's going to heal this man, and he's going to give him a lecture about humility. But then he gives them a, a story, a, a, we call it a parable, uh, to, to tell them their situation, to tell them the circumstances and how God felt about them, and that's the purpose of the story. Again, what's, what's the purpose of Scripture? It's to tell us about God. Now, it uses illustrations, it uses people, it uses real-life situations, but how God deals with these people ultimately is not to find out more about yourself. It's more for you to find out who God is. Who is God, really? How does, how does He feel about you, and how does He treat... Here's a very important topic. How does God handle sinners, since you are one of those? Uh, what's, what's eternity going to be like for a sinner, and how does a sinner correctly relate to a holy God. Wow, that is a message that you and I desperately need to hear. And so we find Jesus making these comments here. And I've said since chapter 9, basically you're in the last three years, three months of Jesus' ministry. He's winding it down. He's been now for three years in the area of Galilee. And for the last three or four months of his ministry, he's headed south. He's going to spend his final week in Jerusalem. Of course, he's going to be crucified. He's going to resurrect. The church is going to be inaugurated, coming to the Holy Spirit. Of course, we have that on, and Luke's going to tell us all about that in the book of Acts. So let's get to the story. He's been invited. They've, they've brought him there to interrogate him. They've brought him there to catch him at something he's going to say so that they can have a point to accuse him from. And Jesus turns the tables, as he always does, on them with this story in verse 16, the most masterful storyteller there ever was, none other than Jesus. So you're probably going to be familiar with this story, but you may not be familiar with the correct interpretation of it. And by God's grace, I'm going to hopefully bring that to you. And the reason why I say that is because we interpret it as people who live in the West in 2022. And that will not get you the correct interpretation. So it's, it's a place to start, but it's not a place to finish. And so we're going to see if we can't finish it today. Verse 16. A certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. Now, you've been in one of those dinners, right? That's why you're easily the place. You're, oh, I've been to a dinner with a certain person that invited me over. Well, yeah, that's about the only thing that you have in common with this. Everything else is going to be different. At the dinner hour... He sent his slave. By the way, he would have invited the whole town. You ever done that? This is a big deal. Sent one of his slaves. You have one of those? I hope not. To say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. This is the second invitation. They were so they would do a course of two. They alike began to make excuses. You ever made an excuse not to go to somebody's house? 
Of course you have. You ever re-gifted a gift? Of course you have. <laughs> Sometimes your excuses were legitimate, right? I mean, you know, you got in a car wreck. You couldn't go. Something came up. I mean, those were legitimate excuses. The excuses they're about to give are absolutely, positively absurd. They may not be to you, but I'll help you understand that by God's grace here in a bit. He says, they, they alight, began to make excuses. First one said, I bought a piece of land and need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. It doesn't sound bad, but wait until you hear. And another one says, I have bought five, five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. doesn't sound bad, but wait until you hear. And another said, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I can't. she slammed her sandal down and said, we're not going, right? Doesn't sound bad, but wait until you hear. We're going to get to it. The slave came back and reported to his master. Then the head of the household became angry, said to his slave, go at once in the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, master, We've done all that you've been, been commanded, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges. These non-Jews lived out there. Jews and Gentiles didn't eat together, but he's breaking some major uh, codes, ethic, ethnic codes here, and he's going to invite the Gentiles in. Oh, this is an absurd story for them. Bring in, the, he says, bring in from the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled, for I tell you, none of those men who were invited, shall taste of my dinner. So he, he's telling this very, very uh, seemingly understandably, understandable story from where we sit. Like I said, our problem with it is, is that we live in 2022. We don't live in the Middle East. And we, we are not of this culture. So, so helping us get to that place, let me give you some explanations here. So our tendency, again, is to read it like Western 2022 people. And if we do that, we come up with not the full-orbed view, not the full-orbed inter interpretation. And I've said this before. Until we correctly interpret the Scriptures, you do not have the Scriptures. I'll say it again. Until we correctly interpret what the Bible has to say, you do not actually have the Bible. Just because you've got a Bible with you doesn't mean you have the truth. Because in, until you know what it says. So I've got a Bible written all in Greek. Do I have the truth? Well, I won't know what it says. So I'm going to put it under my pillow and somehow by osmosis the truth is going to sink into my head. I'm going to interpret Greek sometime in my sleep. No! They're, they're written words and those written words have to be interpreted correctly. The reason why I say this is you've got Mormons walking the streets all the time carrying a Bible. A very good Bible. King James Version. They are teaching you a way to go to God that the Bible does not teach. Using the Bible to do it in manipulating it and cutting things out and making a quilt out of it, you know, cutting a piece over here and sewing it to a piece over here and cutting out the middle and all that stuff. You can do that, but you don't have the scriptures when you do that. You have something false. And what, what false is, is making God say something that he never said. Or in our case, we have something that's not complete because we're hearing something, understanding something that's not the full orbed view of what's being communicated to us. Jesus is communicating to a very specific culture. They would have understood it very well. And by God's grace, like I said, I'm going to help us understand that together. First of all, their social system in the first century Israel was not like ours. Uh, it was much like it had been the previous 2,000 years for them, though. They were rural. They were agrarian. They, were, uh, they related to each other in clans and families. Uh, they lived in traditional sites. They did traditional things that had been handed down to them from centuries, for centuries before uh, they were, there were no entertainment, there were no theaters, there was no television, there was no phones, there was no internet. There was also, for the most part, no travel. You spend your whole life living in one town and never going anywhere else. When it got daylight, or almost daylight, you went to work. When it got dark, you went home. The only time you socialized any day of the week was either on a Sabbath day in which they would have people over, or every evening you would have one major meal. They would eat two small meals during the day, one major meal. Whoever came over was the people you socialized with. So their food, the, the, the meal, the party, if you will, at the end of the day, or in this case a huge party, was your only social events. There was no, they did nothing else. They, they have... A, a great priest pr feast prepared for them by a prominent person. This would have been the highlight of their entire year. They didn't, it's hard for you to understand, and me to understand, they didn't do anything else. 
They didn't go anywhere. So if I'm being invited by a prominent member in my thousand-person community, I'm not missing that because I don't get to do anything else. I don't get to go anywhere. I don't get to socialize with anybody. Even the people in my thousand-member town, unless they work in the same fields I do, I don't see them. So this is my shot, and I guarantee you, not for love or money, am I missing this. That's why I'm telling you, the story that Jesus tells them is absurd. It would have never happened. They would have thought, surely he's joking. No one would ever do what these people do, which is turn down the invitation. But let's, let's continue. Again, the pinnacle of their social life would have been before them, and it would have been absurd for them to turn it down. The invitations work like this. So, so they would be invited. So here it is in the fall. My wife and I, Valerie, let's say, is one of our daughters is getting married. They're not. Don't start that rumor. Don't start Facebook and all that stuff. They're not. And if they are, we're mad at them because they're not telling us. But anyway, let's say we have a daughter. And by the way, not at all unusual for us to know six, eight, ten months, twelve months in advance that our daughter's getting married for number one reason, because we would have arranged that marriage. That's their culture. We would have known a long time ago who she's marrying, and now she's of age, now he's of age, and actually has an income and a house for her to move into, which was also part of their culture. And that's a great way, by the way. You want to date my daughter? I need to see you know, your past 12 months of, of, uh, of I mean, your past, past six years of, of, of your uh, income statements, and I also need to see your house that you're going to move her to and all that, because she's used to having it pretty good at my house, and I expect that she's going to have the same at your house. That was just the way they ran things. So not unusual at all that we would say here in October that we're going to be having a wedding in the spring, but I would invite you, I would invite all you people, I'd say, come to my house in the spring, and we're going to have my, wife, my daughter and her betrothed are going to be married. Of course, your first question is what? What day? You would have never asked that question in this culture. Because you know, even though there is a day, you know that I cannot know what day that is. It's impossible. Unless, unless you think that I'm some kind of major uh, uh, weather predictor. Because in, in this culture, there is not a day. There is only a season. So that's one of the things we wouldn't understand. Of course, we're going to whip out our calendar. We're going to Google Calendar, Apple Calendar. Oh, I, I have something happening on this day, but on that day, I'm available. They had no such issues. They didn't, again, do anything else. They worked all day. They slept all night, they got up and did it again, they would see somebody on a Sabbath day and otherwise a party day, and they didn't do anything else. Again, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around this condition. That's the way that it was. By the way, that's the way it has been in the world, not just their culture, but all cultures, up until just recently. We think, oh, well, everybody's just like us. No, they're not. They're not like us at all. They haven't been like us. Most people were like them for the previous two, four, six thousand years. Okay. So, so you would have gotten the first indication, invitation, which would have said what's going to happen, where it's going to happen, but it definitely wouldn't have said when. You, I may could have given you a month, but it's unnecessary because here's what you know. You know that I can't feed you any vegetables until the vegetables get ripe. And when do they get ripe? When they get ripe. I can't predict what that is. Who knows if it's going to snow this winter, if it's going to freeze late. Who knows how much rain we're going to get and when we're going to get rain. And all these variables have to do when the vegetables get ripe. And so they may get ripe early if we get a good season, if we get warmer weather in early April. Or they may not be ripe until the first part of May. You, if you want to come to my wedding, you've got to have that kind of maneuverability. Which, of course, like I said, you, you do. Because you don't do anything else. This is the pinnacle of your social life. You wouldn't miss it for love of money. You wouldn't. When do animals get big enough for us to slaughter and eat them? When they do. When they do. I was gonna, about to say, when the pig gets big enough, of course, these are Jews. They wouldn't have had pigs. But if you're coming to my house, we're slaughtering a pig. I tell you what, I love pigs. We're going to have some bacon. You're going to have some ham. So, 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 so again, everything is on a contingent of weather, of rain, of whatever is going on otherwise. And it, so I can't give you, nor would you expect me to give you, a day. Really, not even a week. We would understand it would be probably April or probably May. But sometime in the spring, 
I'm having a party. My wife and I are inviting you over. It would have been totally acceptable to you. Again, this is a world without clocks. They lived on a different pace. This is a world without refrigeration. So, so when the harvest comes in, that's when it's in. We, we, if, if we don't dry it to preserve it, we have to cook it. And once it's cooked, how long does it stay hot? So that's when you come, by the way. So, so once the animal is slaughtered, I, my wife and I, you notice we've had a cow tied in the front yard, but you noticed a day ago the cow's not tied up in the front yard. You know, uh-oh, they're about to kill that thing. They're feeding it out in the backyard somewhere. And I noticed also that Brother Bill, part of, his, part of his garden out there has been harvested. So, oh boy, here we go. Could be any day now you'd be sitting with bated breath because, again, you don't do anything else. You have to eat at least three times a day. And the fact that my wife and I are going to be putting on a major feed, you wouldn't miss it. This is an absurd story because everybody in this story who have been invited are not coming once they receive this second, second invitation. So for us, without a day in time, we wouldn't be there. But for them, it absolutely would be a highlight of their lives. In fact, not only was it this, but it was also a social occasion because whoever you sit next to is who you get to talk to. So if I'm the prominent person in the community putting on a big feed, your goal would be to sit next to me. Because if you sit from me to Margaret, you're not, I'm not talking to Margaret. I'm right now talking to Margaret. I see you over there, Margaret. Glad you're here. But if I'm sitting at a meal, who am I going to talk to? The person on my right hand, the person on my left hand, and the person sitting across from me? And that's all the conversation I'm going to be able to have because, number one, I'm stuffing my face. Number two, it's just it's going to be too loud. You know how it is. And so as soon as the dinner bell was rung, as soon as the y'all come, come, and, come and eat thing, they would literally run because this is your social event. See, I, I think I'm more important than you, and you think you're more important than me. And honestly, whoever gets the first seats are the ones that prove who they are. That's why, as Jesus said to the, about the Pharisees, he said this about them. They love the best places at the feast, the best seats of the synagogue. It's their only chance to shine. That, that they would be sitting to my right or my left would be the opportunity that they have to tell you people that they're better than you. So they would run. And they would play musical chairs. And if someone showed up who was more important than you, you would have to give up your spot and move down to a lesser spot. Hopefully there wouldn't be four or five seats away from the host spot. You follow me? So it's a very cultural thing. Also, when they invited people, they would make sure that they would invite people who could pay them back. So I might be inviting Margaret, but I wouldn't invite Tom because Tom and Dee don't have any money. And I know that they can't, I'm not going to get an invitation back to their house because they can't feed me. So I'm, not only am I creating a social event in which everybody can see how important we are and who the people are, but I'm also creating a social event that guarantees me another party at someone else's house. This is the way that they rolled. And so they would invite certain people who could pay them back and other people wouldn't get invitations. Just the way it was. Again, you have to understand this culture in order to understand what Jesus is saying and why they would have taken it that way. That's why these guys would have been playing musical chairs because they want to show you how important they are. And they want to make sure that they're there because they plan to have the same party and they want to make sure that you come because that makes them look important. And of course, they're going to let you sit by them because you did the op you reciprocated uh, with them. So then we have the excuses in verse 18. A after the come and get it, the most bizarre thing happens in Jesus' story. The people without exception, began to make the people who had pre-accepted invitation back in the fall now are refusing to come. You say, well, they're making excuses. No, they're refusing to come. I'll, I'll explain. So here's what's happening. They they're all should be waiting. It's going to be today. It's going to be tomorrow. They all began, it says, likewise, to make excuses. To make an excuse in a culture like this. So first of all, understand there's only 1,000 people in our town. I know your business. You tell me you can't come, I'll know why before you ever come. So, so these excuses are not excuses. They're effectively saying we refuse to come. I know your business. I know what's going on. I know what's happening or not happening. I wouldn't have to have an excuse for me if there was a legitimate one because I would already know. We're, we're half related to each other anyway. I've got in-laws and outlaws together. We've been living in this community. We were raised in this community. Our grandparents were raised in this community. Our great-great-grandparents were raised in this community. We know everybody's business. And so what's happening here, like I said, is very absurd. To say that you wouldn't go is essentially to refuse to come is considering fighting words. 
Think about it. You spent thousands of dollars, months planting, harvested part of your field to feed to these people for totally free, slaughtered the best animals you have. There's no refrigeration. There's no way to carry it over or postpone it for another week. Today's the day. And then you say, even knowing way ahead of time, you start saying to me excuses why you can't come. You're not in the hospital. You're not dead. Here are the excuses. So they refuse, and effectively what they're saying when you did something like this, these kind of excuses, you're effectively saying there's a war between us and them. That's why we're not going. We're feuding. And by the way, you should never expect an invitation back again because that was just the culture. Here's the excuses. Listen to what they say. So, so hundreds would have been invited. Jesus gives three examples of the excuses they make. First of all, the number one, it says they said they bought a piece of land. Happened all the time. And they have to go see it. Today. The, the day that everything's ready. That the harvest is in and the fattened calf has been killed and we prepared everything and the table is set and you've been warned months in advance. But today you can, why can't you go tomorrow and see this piece of land? Again, because you don't want to come. And you're making it very, by, by the way, very publicly clear that you're not coming to our house, which tells me that you and I are... That was their culture. It's totally absurd. Unless you're, unless you're going to war with them, you would never say something like this. Notice, they hate Jesus, they plan to crucify him, and yet he's sitting at a meal with them. So even their worst enemies would still not refuse to go. They would have meals together. Because it wasn't until you officially declared something open that there was any kind of issues. And so, so these people are openly declaring that. It was, it's totally absurd. So one buy, buys another excuse. Bought five yoke of oxen. That's ten oxen. That's an extreme expenditure. By the way, if you had the capacity to buy ten oxen, you were not running those ten oxen. You had a slave that did that for you. You had a servant that did that for you. And, and again, why can't you do it tomorrow? Because you don't want to come to my house today. I spent all this money. I made all these plans. We live in this community all of our lives. We know each other. And you're doing this to me on today. It's a major slap in the face. Massive. And then the third one, of course, is that they get married, which to us doesn't seem unusual. My wife has a wedding planning business. We'll have people call us the day before they want to get married. Is it okay if we come to the beach and get married tomorrow? I guess so. I guess so. You got a marriage license, it's got to be 72 hours old unless you're in the military, and then they'll waive that. I mean, that's, we, have, we understand elopement in this, in this culture. They didn't. There was no such thing. You, you did not do that. Again, most marriages were arranged. And if they were not arranged, you would have known way in excess months ahead of time that these two people are getting hitched. And by the way, you wouldn't have missed it, like I said, for love or money. The fact that he says he's gotten married when no one else knows, that's absurd. Even more importantly, because we know he's from this community, he's planned his marriage and his wedding over the top of your party that you announced six months ago, and y'all are vying for the same guests. What's he trying to prove? What's he trying to say? Me and you, we're at odds. That's exactly the way it would have been taken. Again, until we understand the culture... Until we understand what's going on. And the excuse he has is, I married a woman. So what, she slammed down her sandal. This is a male-dominated culture. So you're going to come out and say that you're that henpecked by this woman that you can't go. He would have never said that. Totally absurd. So Jesus is giving a very unlikely story. Of course, what happens here, what, what happens is, as, as they would have all assumed, is that the the, the prominent person who invites everybody over gets super mad. Of course he did. Of course he did. He, he's, he's been affronted by most of the community. He's been led to believe that all this stuff that he's putting together for, at his own expense, that everyone's going to come. And he's been treated very absurdly, very rudely. So he's invited the likelies, and they've refused. And so now what he's going to do is invite the unlikelies. Again, the reason why they invite most people, the likely people, is so that they would reciprocate. I would invite Tom because Tom wouldn't invite me back. No, I know he would. Tom, you would. Right. Can I have your name? Can I have you say it in front of the whole congregation? Yes, he would. <laughs> <Out loud. laughs> 
So, so certain people didn't get invited because they didn't have the capacity to invite us back. And that was just, they had a strong caste system. So certain castes, because you're able to bring me back to your party next year when your daughter gets married, so I'm inviting you to my daughter's party, and it just guarantees, it's guaranteeing a social life for us. Because we don't have a life otherwise. We don't do anything else. So our, our babies being born and our children getting married and big parties and bar mitzvahs and stuff like that would be the only social life that we have. And so I would want to make sure that I'm inviting the people who are capable of also feeding me really good, uh, hopefully pretty soon. And I would not invite the people who were incapable of that, the, if you will, the unlikelies. That's the ones who he sends his servants out to. Go to the streets. Go, go, go get the lame and the crippled and the unlikelies. These would have all been Jews. But the unlikelies, it's interesting that Jesus comes, of course, to the likelies. Who were the likelies that Jesus came to? They were very religious people. Can you tell me the middle letter in the Bible? How about the middle word? How about the middle book? Psalm 119, I'll beat you on that one. That's the biggest one, actually. Psalm 118 is the middle. Can you tell me the middle word or the middle letter? They could tell you all that stuff. They, they had Bibles. You know how we get around the Bible, you know, Luke chapter 18, verse 4. That, their Bibles didn't have that. They had a book of Luke, or not this case. They had the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah. They didn't have chapters and verses. They could quote the first two words in a sentence, a verse in the book of Isaiah, which, by the way, was a tremendously big scroll. And they'd immediately know where they were supposed to go. They knew the Bible that well. The first two words of any sentence in the book of Isaiah, and you know immediately where to open your scrolls to. Wow. They were that verse in the Scriptures. Jesus comes to the likelies to the ones who had been reading the Bible and getting an invitation to come to, the, to, the, to, to the God's great feast, right? To be in right relationship with God, to go to heaven. They've been invited, 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 and now the final invitation comes. He comes to the likelies, and the likelies say, oh, we don't want them to do that. We already have our own religion. We already have our own Savior. It's us. We're saving ourselves because we're good people, supposedly. We already have our own religion, and so Jesus, of course, goes because the likelies aren't available. He goes to the unlikelies. He spends his whole ministry surrounded with unlikelies, like tax collectors and fishermen and political activists and prostitutes and the sick and the afflicted, because these people were willing to confess that they were sinners in need of a Savior, unlike the likely people, the people who knew the Bible, or should have. So Jesus goes to the unlikelies, and that's, the same, that's what this same story is turning on here. And by the way, it says here that you have to bring them in. They would have had to do that. Because not only it would have been a problem for me to invite Tom and Dee because Tom and Dee wouldn't pay me back, but also if I had invited them, they would have refused to come for the same reason. Because it's expected in this culture that if you don't pay back, it's a major faux pas. We, we moved to a little town outside of Laredo uh, uh, called Miranda City. I was a pastor there for a while, and we uh, had an occasion where we made some food for some people, and we gave them a casserole dish, the only casserole dish we had, and the lady didn't return the casserole dish. So, like, well, I mean, what do you do? I mean, she lived right behind us. I mean, you, you go over there and ask for it. And we found out later on the reason why she didn't return it is because she hadn't put any food in it yet. So in that culture, you didn't bring back an empty dish. If somebody brought you a dish of food, you put food in it to bring it back. And it was socially unacceptable to do anything other than that. We didn't know. Same is true in this culture. It was very considered very reciprocal. You didn't do something unless you expected something back from the people. And so the same people who I wouldn't have invited the unlikelies also wouldn't have come because they're unable to fill up the dish. Make sense? So it wasn't just the unlikelies who get, who get invited and who actually come. They have to be made to come. But then he says he sends them out after the poor are brought in. There's still plenty of seats down in verse 23. So this hum humble Jewish populace would have been pictured by the poor but the next group is not Jewish. He tells them to go out what, in, outside the city to the highways and to the byways and compel them to come in. You would have had to compel them because it was against the law for a Gentile to eat with a Jew. You would have gotten yourself arrested. So, so you would have to make them, what are you trying to do? Get me arrested? I can't go in and eat at this man's feast. I'm a Gentile. He says, no, make them come. Make them come. We're going to waive the rules. The unlikelies, the likelies don't want to come. The, li the unlikelies are here, but we still have plenty of seats. So invite them. Tell them to come. These people would have been totally blown away. They were getting invited to a feast like this? So, so, so we've gone from the likelies to the unlikelies to the nevers. They would have never considered themselves 
able to make it into a feast like this. But that's exactly who Jesus has sent us to. Remember the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. All nations. He told his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. Those are the likelies. And in Samaria, unlikelies. And in the uttermost parts of the earth, the never, see what a, Jews never thought that they would be Gentiles like us in heaven. But again, what is Jesus telling us? He said, this is what the kingdom of God is really like. This is who the Father is. These are those who are being included, and these are, more importantly, I guess to conclude, are the exclusions. So anyone who made an excuse and refused to attend something like this would have never been invited back. They just get one chance. You realize that the invitation God has given to you, which is this life that you live in, you're only getting one shot at this. You're only getting one shot. And you can continue to live your life in opposition to God and not submit yourself to who God is. And you'll probably get it tomorrow. I'm not guaranteeing that, but you probably will. But you realize once this life's over, you're not getting another shot. You're not getting another chance. The invitation to come to God and confess that you're a sinner and repent of those sins and turn to Christ, you're getting one life to do that with. You're not going to get a second one. You're not going to get it. Everything shifts here in verse 24 and following from a third person to a first and second person because Jesus is making an application to this generation. The Jews, of course, were the special invited guests. They, they had the invitation, right? I mean, they had the whole Old Testament for 400 years before Jesus got it. Whole invitation of God. But when the ultimate invitation came through their son Jesus, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. Today, these scriptures have been fulfilled in your hearing. When that invitation came, they said, oh, we're not coming. So, so can you imagine how a landowner, how a person with a party would have experienced how angry they would have got? He says, now I'm trying to teach you about how God's going to respond to a person who refuses the invitation. It's not going to be good. You're not going to get a second chance. Jesus was the way to the banquet. He was the door. He was the truth. He was, and, and since those things were true, they didn't want anything to do with that. They had it in for him. They, they all said yes to the first invitation, but the second invitation required them to come through God's Son, and they weren't going to have anything for that. They didn't want that. And so guess what happens? They got to die in their pride instead of live in humility, and that's your options. You know the difference between heaven and hell? Hell is going to be a place where you get to die in your pride. And heaven is going to be a place where you get to live forever, but in humility. Here, Jesus gives them well, that was their option, so he gives it to them. How often, he says, how many times can he invite them? I would long together, wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. They weren't getting a second chance. Just one. God's reaction, like I said, is permanent if you refuse his invitation. It's permanent exclusion. John three thirty six. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. It's a guarantee. Have you trusted God's Son, Jesus? Have you placed your faith in Him? He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. There's one or the other. Which will it be? Who's making it to this dinner that God's giving for all of us? Anyone who's willing to come to the place where they say that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus is not just the invitation. He's the way in. He's the door. He's everything. I ask you if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we talk just a bit and then pray together. Have you responded to God's invitation? How long do you expect this life to last? It's your one shot. You're not getting another one. To be reconciled to God, you don't get to do that on your terms. It's not your heaven, it's not your eternal life. It's God, and it belongs to Him. And He says there's no way to Him except through His Son. He sent Jesus to die, to pay. And we have to decide for eternity who's going to pay for our sins. Either we get to pay for our sins in a place called hell, or Jesus... He prefers to pay for our sins on a cross that he died on 2,000 years ago. But you have to decide, how is my sins, because all sins going to be paid for. How are my sins going to be paid? God's choice is that you come to him through his son. 
I am the way, Jesus says, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you coming through his son? It's a matter of, of confessing that you're a sinner in need of a savior and turning your, and placing your entire faith on him, Jesus, the son of God, who died to pay for your sins, the eternal one paying for uh, eternal crimes that you've committed. Jesus, we thank you that you are that savior. We are, in, we are sinners in need of a savior. We, whether we confess it or not, it's who we are. And we thank you, God, that we even have an invitation. You could have planned heaven and left us out, but you didn't. Your desire was that you didn't want heaven without us, just like we sang. You didn't want to be in heaven without us, and so you became one of us so that you could die and take our place, pay for our sins, and offer us the only way, the only invitation that we're going to get. I pray, God, if someone here has not responded to that invitation, that they would do that today. One life we have one chance we have. Thank you, Lord, that we have that opportunity. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.